Hello, statisticians. Mr. Young Saber here from Skew the Script. Today we're going to talk about a very serious topic. That's public mass shootings in the United States. And we talk about it through the use of residuals as well as different ways of measuring them. Let's skew it. Today's lesson is on residuals, R squared, and the standard deviation of residuals it is unit three, lesson three in R sequence. Um, one quick content warning, we're gonna be talking about public mass shootings in today's video. So if that is disturbing to you for any reason, you might wanna tune out at this time. Um, so there are usually three explanations given in media as well as politics for the prevalence of mass shootings in the United States. That is the prevalence of assault rifles and their availability, uh, mental health issues within the United States, as well as cultural problems such as maybe violent video games. So in today's key analysis, we're gonna talk about which of these issues is most related to the recent rise we've seen in mass shootings in the United States. This is lesson 3.3. We're gonna go into the guided notes right now. If you'd like to follow along, follow the URL on the screen right now. Compared to most wealthy nations around the world, the United States has the highest frequency per person of gun-related deaths. Um, and today we're gonna to talk about specifically public mass shootings. I'm gonna define public mass shootings by the following four or more victims, and indiscriminate targeting. So this excludes shootings that are in private residences, because that's not public, and shootings that stem from other crimes, such as, say, armed robbery. Um, now, public mass shootings are only a small fraction of gun deaths that occur in the United States. However, what we found is that they've been growing in frequency. Not constantly, but we've seen growth in the frequency of violent ma or public mass shootings over time. And here are some ones that got a lot of media attention in the past several years. In particular, the one that occurred in a Thousand Oaks bar, that's Borland Grill, in which 13 people were killed. A really, really, really tragic event. A shooter came into the bar and opened fire. Police responded, did a valiant job. One police officer put his life on the line and was killed. Um, Thousand Oaks is located just northwest of Los Angeles. It is a small town known for being a suburb nice houses, sunshine. Um, the reason I know this is because actually I am from Thousand Oaks, California. I grew up there. Here's my old library card at Thousand Oaks Library. Here's me climbing one of the many oak trees for which Thousand Oaks is named. Um, so this is a very serious topic and it's one that because of that, I want to analyze with the use of data science and the skill sets that we learn in this class. So like I said, usually there are three responses to public mass shootings. Um, position one is that we should restrict assault weapons. Assault weapons are too easy to get. We should restrict how you can get them. Position two is it's a mental health issue. It's not about guns, it's about mental health. Mental illness is the real cause of why these events happen. And position three is that it's something that has to do with our culture. Um, often media outlets, politicians point to violent video games as potential causes or influences on mass shooters. So we're gonna talk about these three things in context of what we're learning today. First, we're gonna talk about the idea of residuals. Residual is the error or the vertical distance between a linear model's prediction and the actual observed Y value of a data point. Um, and here's the formula for residual here. So let's talk about in a previous example we were looking last lesson. Uh, this is a scatter plot of the percent of school days a student attended and uh, test scores on algebra one exam. Um, we found the model by getting the squared residuals. And when we wanna make a prediction, uh, we're gonna use that model to make our prediction. And we're gonna talk about residual coming off this prediction. So say it was a new student coming to school and as old school as attendance was 80%, we're gonna predict he's gonna have 80% attendance again coming to this new school. What is his predicted test score according to our linear model? So we're gonna plot the X coordinate of X equals 80. And we're gonna see if his attendance is 80, what is his predicted Y value according to our model, his predicted algebra one score. So we plug in 80 to our formula, our least squared regression line formula, and the predicted Y value was 37.91. So that student would almost score maybe about 38 points on the test in our model. That's our prediction. Um, but now we're gonna talk about, instead of the prediction, the actual data point too. Uh, say the student gets 44 questions correct on the exam after attending school 80% of the time. So his actual data point was here. Um, so what is the error? What was our model's prediction error, i.e. the residual for the student? That's this distance right here in orange. 
The residual is found by taking the actual y value and subtracting the predicted y value from the model. So in this case, we're going to subtract 37.91 from 44, his actual score, and the residual is 6.09. We are off in predicting their um, algebra one score by about six questions. Um, so when we talk about interpreting residual, we use this template, this stem. Um, so in this case, the actual test score was greater than predicted by 6.09 points. You may notice there is a, a key facet here to residuals. It's always the actual Y value minus predicted. So when that result is positive, when we have a positive residual, that means the actual Y value was above the predicted. So we under predicted uh, the value. If the residual is negative, that means the actual Y value was below predicted. So we over predicted the value. So that's the difference there. Now, residual plots is a way to visualize residuals and talk about if our linear model is a good one. Um, if you have an ideal residual plot, this is what it's going to look like. Here's a linear model for um, speed and uh, a distance. And we can model this data with a linear regression. It looks like a positive model. And what we can do is take the residuals, these vertical distances between the data points and the predictions on the least square regression line, and zoom in on them by just graphing a graph with the y-axis being residuals. So these are going to be centered at zero, meaning that on average, the residual value is going to be zero, and there's going to be some above and some below, meaning we underpredicted or overpredicted. And this is what a good residual plot looks like. The residuals are pretty random. They have a random scatter around the value of zero. There's some higher, there's some lower, there's some higher magnitude, there's some lower magnitude. This means the linear model is a good fit. We captured the general trend of the data without capturing necessarily some of that random variability that we couldn't capture anyway. We're not connecting the dots, it's just a straight line model. Now, let's take a look at, at this model for this data. Uh, here's a model where we see, there might be a little bit of curvature in the data. And if we plot the residuals alone in a residual plot, that really accentuates the curvature. We see the residuals tend to be positive for lower values, then negative for middle values, and then they get positive again. That's a clear curved pattern in the residuals. Because the residuals show a clear curved pattern, a linear model is not a good fit here. We should probably do a model with some curvature to capture that pattern. So it's not random, therefore it is not a good fit. Finally, one last uh, deviation from a good uh, linear fit is called heteroscedasticity, my favorite word in statistics. Um, we see here in the residual plot that there's a funneling effect. The variation around the least square regression line gets larger as the x values increase. We start with little variation and a stronger correlation, and then we have weaker correlation with larger variation. There's more variation in residuals as the x values increase, so linear model is not a good one here, is not a good fit. Um, we call that heteroscedasticity. Say five times fast, I dare you, it's really hard. So let's talk about one metric for measuring these residuals, which is the standard deviation of residuals. So we noticed that public mass shootings have become more frequent over time. And again, let's talk about a data set here for these three potential quote unquote causes. Um, we have assault rifles, we have mental health, we have video games. We collected data on, uh, for each of those years, the number of public mass shootings, the amount of rifles manufactured in the United States during that year, the amount of U.S. residents with mental health disorders classified, and the revenue from U.S. video game sales. Um, here are the correlations we found. This is public mass shootings uh, with rifle production in the United States as an explanatory variable. Here is public mass shootings with mental health cases in the United States as an explanatory variable. This is public mass shootings with video game sales as an explanatory variable. Each of the data points represents a different year between 1994 and 2019. So we can fit a least regression line model to each of these, but then the question becomes, which issue given these models, so again, which issue given these models is most related to the rise in mass shootings? Another way to put that more precisely in terms of our data is which variable most strongly predicted shootings? In other words, which had the least error? And the best way we can put this question, the most specific way is, which model has the smallest residuals on average? And one way we can look at that is the standard deviation of residuals. You may remember standard deviation from an earlier unit. Standard deviation is a typical distance between data points and their mean. The standard deviation of residuals is a typical error, typical residual length 
typical error between data points in a least squared regression line. So let's talk about, in two simple data sets, what this means. We fit a line to these two data sets. Obviously, A is a stronger correlation, B is a weaker correlation. Um, so one way to interpret how much stronger this relationship is to look at their standard deviation, their residuals. Obviously, the residuals in B tend to be larger than residuals in A. We can use S, the standard deviation residuals, as the typical residual length. In this case, standard deviation residuals like a little, tiny little bit. Standard deviation residuals here is a little bit larger. So when there's a stronger correlation, we have a smaller standard deviation of residuals. When there's a weaker correlation, we have a larger standard deviation of residuals. Um, so let's talk about specific values now. Looking back at our attendance versus star scores um, graph, the standard deviation residuals was about 1.99. Let's interpret this value. So the average or the typical residual length, excuse me, is 1.99. So the stem we can use for this is when using the least squared regression line, will typically be off, we'll typically have a res typical residual value of the standard deviation residuals. So in this case, when using the least square regression line with attendance, that's explanatory variable, to predict test scores, we'll typically be off by about 1.99 points. So in other words, our predictions are typically off by about two questions, two questions right or wrong on the test. That's the length of those residuals. So typical length is about two test points. Um, so let's talk about standard deviation residuals here. If we're using rent production as the explanatory variable and we map all those residuals, we calculate standard deviation residuals, it comes out to 1.31. Here, standard deviation residuals for mental health as an explanatory variable is 1.69. So now we have a quantitative measurement of difference in strength. Um, we are making less of an error typically with ref production as explanatory variable. There's less prediction error here. So ref production is a stronger predictor, the more accurate predictor of mass shooting frequency annually. Now let's talk about another measurement of strength, the coefficient determination, or more commonly called R squared. So this relates to R, the correlation coefficient, as you might have guessed. Um, let's talk about R squared. R squared is simply, you take R, correlation coefficient, and you square it. Um, so 1 squared is 1, 0.9 to 1 squared is 0.83, etc. You'll notice that the negatives turn into positives. So what is useful about R squared is 1, it gets rid of the negatives because it turns positive. So now we're just focusing on strength, not about direction. It's just focusing on strength. And it really emphasizes differences in strength. You'll notice that for values that had a higher strength when it was just the correlation coefficient, and for values that had a lower strength, there was less distance, whereas now there might be more distance. So for example, if we look at the strong positive correlation versus the weak positive correlation, there was a moderate difference in their R value, but then when we squared the R value, it really accentuated that difference. It became a lot more different. And so R squared is more sensitive to differences in strength. Um, so R squared is close to zero, indicating a weak correlation. R squared is close to one, indicating a strong correlation. And we can prove that as a percent according to this interpretation. And let's talk about this interpretation for a second. So what percent of the data's pattern can be explained by a linear model for these two data sets? Well, one is a perfect correlation where we capture all the data points exactly. One is a moderate, weaker correlation. Um, so in the first case, 100% of the variation between those data points and their Y values is completely explained by the linear regression model. The linear model completely explains the data's pattern. Our R squared is going to be 100%. We have 100% of the variation explained. In this case, the R-squared value was 72%. The linear model explains some of the variation in the data. We captured some of that trend that was positive, but there is also still some random variability that we did not capture. We only captured 72% of the Y-value pattern in this data with our linear model. There is still some that we cannot explain. That's the general idea of an R-squared value. So in this case, the R-squared value was 0.62 for predicting the number of mass shootings with the number of rifles produced in the United States. Um, so let's throw that into our interpretation stem. That means that 62% of the variation in yearly mass shootings can be explained by the linear relationship with yearly rifle production. So yearly rifle production explains 62% of that variation in yearly mass shootings. We can look at the different R-squared values across these different distributions. Um, the R-squared value for mental health was only 0.36. The R-squared value for video game sales was a little bit higher, 0.69. So, in this case, video game sales were actually the strongest predictor of the annual frequency of public mass shootings in the United States. Um, 
Now, for one second, we're going to come back to the issue at hand, but we're going to talk about the relationship between Sandy Beach's residuals and R squared. So for a strong relationship like relationship A, we have a low Sandy Beach's residuals because our residuals, our typical length is low. We have a high R squared. For a weak correlation, we have a high Sandy Beach's residuals because there's a lot of typical variation, and we have a low R squared, our value is close to zero. Now let's talk about quickly the effect of outliers. So what is an outlier in the linear regression model? Well, let's take a look at this one. Uh, you see that data, data point way far away from their data points? Well, this is actually not an outlier. Even though it's far from their data points, it's still close to our linear model if we extended it. So it's not an outlier. However, this data point is an outlier. It is unusually far from the least square regression line given its x value. Let's talk about this one. Do we think that this data point right here is an outlier? Well, it doesn't look like it's unusually far. It's far from the line, but is it unusually far compared to the other points? Not so much. It is far, but it's not unusually far compared to the other data points in this very weak correlation. So this is not an outlier. So when we're talking about data from a real distribution, um, I actually didn't include one data point in this original distribution of number of rifles manufactured and US public mass shootings that I should have. That was the year 2017. If I include 2017, it is a massive outlier. We see that for 2017, the residual is unusually high. It's unusually far from the least square regression line. So the correlation here was 0.79 when we didn't include 2017 as an outlier. When we do include 2017, the correlation drops down to 0.67. Um, the R squared value is 0.62, and then when we include the outlier, the R squared value drops to 0.45. The standard deviation residuals with no outlier is 1.31, and that raises up to 1.98 when we include the outlier year. So we can see that correlation coefficient, R squared, and standard deviation residuals are not resistant to outliers. Outliers lower the strength of the relationship, which makes the R value, the correlation, smaller in magnitude, the R squared value smaller, and the standard deviation residuals larger because we see more error between the data points and the least regression line. So let's jump into a discussion about the specific data we've been talking about all lesson. We saw that video game sales were the strongest predictor that had the highest R squared value of the annual frequency of mass shootings in the United States for the past 20 years or so. So almost 70% of the variation in yearly public mass shootings can be explained by the linear relationship with video game sales. That's what the R squared value means. So it seems like this position that our culture has evolved that the glorifying violence for video games might be potentially the best explanation. So here's my discussion question for you to walk away with and to answer. Would banning violent video games prevent more mass shootings than the other solutions, maybe banning assault weapons or improving mental health services? Why? or why not? That's it for today. Goodbye, statisticians.